All right, welcome. Uh, Mori Michael. Mori means uh, uh, in Yemenite rabbi. Yeah, right? exactly. Amazing. Good friend of mine and uh, a scholar um, about Torah. And you've published uh, a few um, articles. I see, uh, I saw some articles on uh, Academia, right? The, the website. Uh, also, you some some really interesting ones I saw were on the uh, proto uh, uh, proto Sinaitic proto yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, findings. I'm super super uh, excited to uh, talk about these findings too. Sure. Uh, this is going to be kind of a shorter episode, but one of many. Uh, oh, sure. Actually, most so, of my writing uh, are in the books that I wrote uh, back in the day and okay. before I sort of took a, a couple steps back from. Uh, you know, pure uh, rabbinical Torah teaching mm -hmm. and um, focusing more on academic uh, research. So now I do uh, funded research and um, my website is uh, bigpicturetorah.com. Wow. So you can find basically, you know, so much material of things I've written, you know, throughout the years. Very amazing. Um, and, and you also uh, have some courses also on Torah, right? Yes, and, and exactly. So, uh, Torah defense yeah. workshops. That's amazing. I think um, one of the, uh, the first day I met you, uh, you told me you are also interested in Samaritans. I was like, oh, wow, finally I could have a sit with someone like uh, like scholarly, if you might I call it, and learn about my ancestors. And, you know, uh, as much as I talked about Samaritans and I'm a tour guide, but I think uh, I am missing uh, some information and I... Uh, and I hope today and also to in many future episodes that you can also cover um, what you found out about the Samaritans. 100%. So um, as you obviously know, there's many um, uh, opinions of where do Samaritans come from. And, yeah. um, and uh, after meeting you and sitting with you uh, for uh, uh, days, uh, it's clear that you do not accept, you know, just simple, uh, you know, like hearsay uh, and you do your uh, research so right. what can you um, basically tell us about the Samaritans and what all those you know uh, researches and archaeology even uh, right. tell us about so I have a very odd uh, background uh, even coming into uh, Torah I basically come from an anthropology background at the University of California San Diego and um, I studied not only um, cultural anthropology, but actually my focus was uh, evolutionary biology, uh, that kind of an angle. But um, I did a lot of work in cultural anthropology, and that really is something that gave me the tools to be able to really study uh, the Samaritan now for about five years. Mm -hmm. And um, tools like. Um... Like Bas academic research. Thing. Yeah, basically just like, what do you mean by like keys, you know, to being able to understand a people. Mm. And um, one of the things that, uh, you know, not just the whole field in a sense has really evolved and matured in like the later 20th century is that it used to be that when a people would say about themselves that, oh, you know, we come from this particular place and you know, we're a lost tribe of Israel or, you know, a tribe of Israel, whatever it might be, or we, our ancestors were created in this, you know, from this mountain or whatever. Um, you know, back 19th century, you know, first half of the 20th century, that was always regarded as rubbish. And, but basically, the field came to a much greater respect mm -hmm. for when a people... Um, talks about themselves. In other words, sometimes, you know, it'll be with a little bit of mythological flair, a little bit of exaggeration. But generally, um, a people is to be believed, you know, um, you know, shedding sort of mythical, you know, periphery. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and in fact, in the United Nations, um, one of the signs of, um, of, one of the tokens of, in, of indigenous um, identity to a particular country is actually if you have traditions that you're that 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 you were created, you know, on this mountain, and that happens to be what the Shomeronim believe about Mahar Garizim, mm -hmm. that the that Adam was actually created here, right? That which this is, was Gan Eden, right? right? Which is very right. Uh, Gan Eden is the Garden of Eden. So these are you know, if people can just sort of you know get away from the text and ooh, you know, the Garden of Eden was you know probably to the east or whatever. These are extremely important legends. So basically, um, 
I came in already ready to, to give the benefit of the doubt to the Shomronim and basically, you know, empty my mind of um, rabbinical polemics because there's polemics on both sides right. and basically just, um, you know, approach it from a very objective place. Amazing. So um, the, the, the Shomronim, if you look at you genetically, or if we look at you from what actually um, our rabbis actually taught and what we actually find in in like Nach, like Nevi'im Ketubim, which is the prophets and writings. Um, it's it's funny because, you know, a Jew, just in his, in the annual readings of the Torah, like throughout the year, you end up going through most of the Bible, not just like the five books of Moses, but actually most of the rest of the Bible. Samaritans, as you as Samaritans. Just, uh, I'm talking about Jews. Okay. In, 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 in a Jewish synagogue. And it's, it's incredible how many things are there that really form sort of like a, um, like a trail um, of points about the people who would become the Samaritans. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, in the book of Judges, um, Beth Yosef, the house of Joseph, like there's, there's literally like a synonym for them. They're called the Shomerim. It's, it's literally a synonym for the house of Joseph. And that or was in the north, right? Because it was known that the north had the two, two tribes of Joseph and a, half of Levi. Right. right. So I, I, was, I was really blown away. This is chapter two, you know, book of Judges. And, it, you know, it talks about, you know, first uh, it opens with a conquest, you know, uh, by Judah um, of, the, uh, of, 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 of that territory. Mm -hmm. Then you know, it goes into how Joseph, how, how Beth Yosef, how they conquered Beth El. And then it flips between Beth Yosef and it starts calling you the Shomerim. And lest a person think that, well, what would Shomerim be? So if you go to Jeremiah 31, he is giving a prophecy of how um, basically the Notsrim from the Mount of Ephraim. Mount of Ephraim. Okay, are going to, you know, um, you know, come to Judah, and they're going to give offerings in Jerusalem at the temple. Mount of Ephraim and possibly being... Probably Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim, or at least, you know, this area, these mountains, okay? But what's really powerful is how Lishmor, that's the verb for Shomerim, which is to guard, and Notsrim, Linsor, is are exactly they're perfect synonyms right. so you see very clearly that the people of mount ephraim of this area were called the guardians and we know samaritans means i mean we do use shomrim also mm -hmm. which means guardians mm -hmm. so, so yeah. it's very interesting why would you know Beit yosef okay or actually i regard you all all of the families of the samaritans and this is something the Samaritans actually don't don't uh, understand about themselves. I think you are all um, basically from a community of Kohanim, mm -hmm. of 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 priests, mm -hmm. of, of uh, that you're basically the remnant, and uh, essentially of the uh, the Kohanim of the north. Wow. Mm -hmm. And um, that's actually yeah. just from the horse's mouth. Rabbi Akiva uh, says about um, uh, something very similar, and. Um, um, Josephus actually uh, talks about the Kohanic uh, identity of the Samaritans. Uh, it's a little bit complex, but it's just there. Right. So for anyone to go um, look at the community and brand you as, you know, Kutim or Kuthites, um, they're kind of ignoring uh, the polemics of late Second Temple times, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, they're ignoring a very important element of Samaritan history, which is the fact that there were Kuthites who were transferred here, mm -hmm. right? The Bible isn't inventing anything. There was, in fact, a population. The Assyrians is, uh, brought, right. Right, because um, the Assyrians, they would do transfer populations in order to, like, you know, weaken and be able to control, you know, the, the people that they conquered. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, uh, uh, transferred the, uh, the Bene Israel, the Israelites, you know, out of this land, you know, the northern kingdom. I like to call it the central and northern kingdom because Judah was just more in the south. Okay. And they would they brought indeed Kuthites here. 
And the Samaritans, by your own admission, this how is, many were they? Is known uh, at, that, at the time of the Assyrian conquest. Is it known like how many Samaritans? Were? So this is really really powerful because there actually happens to be, um, you know, from the Assyrian sources an actual number of the Golim, the you know the exiles from the northern kingdom that they that they took from Samaria, and um, it is about. If I remember correctly, 27,900. Uh, that's what, how many exiles. Right. right. Um, and that was a large number for those times, mm -hmm. 27,900. Remember, a lot of people um, were killed mm -hmm. in the war. But, were, but between those killed and those exiled, we're not even talking like 50% of the population. So there was many that stayed. So, so many stayed. And what's incredible is that you can actually, between the book of Kings and Chronicles, you can see very clearly, like when King Hezekiah is, you know, reaching out, you know, to the tribesmen to come and inviting them to worship in Yerushalayim. It's like, it's, it's clear he's not sending these messengers outside the land. Mm -hmm. He's sending them to these tribal areas in the land and the tribes receive them in different ways. Sometimes the messengers are, be are beaten up or what whatever, you know. But it's clear that there are all these, you know, northern kingdom tribes here a while after Assyria did their business. Right. And does the archaeology kind of also point to that, that in a sense... Um... Like say so Samaritan presence or northern Israelite presence was always in the north. Yes. Like, would you say? No. Again, I don't want to call. I don't. I don't. I, north, a lot of people call Israel, it the north. Central. I call. I call it the center of the land. Okay. When we look at think of Israel today, we think of like from a, a Metula. You're right. It is more in the to center. To Eilat. Right. And so Jerusalem is actually the center of the country today. Mm -hmm. But actually. You know, it says in the book in book of Judges that everyone knew that Samuel was a prophet of the Lord from Dan to Beersheba. Those are the borders of Israel. The Negev, you can see that that was like no man's land. So the actual center of the country, if I'm looking like a, like a, like a bullseye. If you look at the map, it, the Mount Gerizim is right in the center also. Was Shechem. Right, Shechem, yeah. Did you ever hear of an archaeologist named uh, Dr. Israel Finkelstein? Mm, maybe. He's very famous from Tel Aviv University, so he's kind of like every. He's kind of like you know, uh, in religious circles, he's you know not liked okay. <laughs> because he is, uh, you know, he rejects the Exodus, and um, so we don't agree with him on a number of things. We don't agree with his chronology, but David Roll, you know, my mentor, or colleague, actually said that he's probably one of the best, if not the best, excavator. In Israel, I mean, so like archaeology, or just like talking about numbers. Archaeologist, or? yeah, he's wow, okay. basically one of the foremost archaeologists in uh, in Israel, and it's interesting how he says that sh that Judah was essentially like the small vassal state to the kingdom of Israel. A vassal in the state south. as like a substate. Or? Yeah, basically like a a, a um, kind of like Israel is to the United States. Ah. <laughs> In other words, the main thing was actually the kingdom of Israel. We do know that it was called Judah because the biggest tribe was, uh, like the dominant tribe was Judah, right? I mean, well, it was Judah and Joseph. Okay. And Judah was, was a very, very powerful tribe. But basically, until the Assyrians, you know, did in the, the northern kingdom, it's like, um, you know, it was a very small and not powerful state and really you know nine and a half tribes it just makes sense that that's going to be really you know the central deal right. so uh, it only makes sense that there would be you know something you know from that Kohanic bastion that was Shechem that would remain as Samaritans you know we believe that um, that Judah came out of the kingdom of Israel, in a sense, right? And um, the, the story goes that there were two high priests, Uzi and Eli. We'll not really get into that right now. It's, it's, it's a really long story, the, the split of the two kingdoms. But I think 
uh, what is uh, worth uh, kind of like go, uh, talking a little bit about was the when we reach, for example, King Solomon and then Rehoboam and Yerobam, what was like the the most important, let's say, the, the thing that really split the two kingdoms? Was it at the times of Solomon or was it like Rehoboam and Yerobam? Like was yeah, well, you know, the actual split was pretty clear that it occurred at that time when Solomon's son, Rehavam, okay, uh, or Rehoboam, mm -hmm. um, was crowned king. And that's a fascinating story. So, because, you know, in the Bible, you would understand that Jerusalem, you know, which was filled with gold, like from one end to the other, you know, that this was, you know, the, uh, the, uh, like La Ciudad de Oro, you know, like this uh, golden city. city yeah. And um, how is it that the son of Solomon, this, this emperor for all in, 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 intents and purposes, um, who established, you know, basically um, made Israel... Can, can, like a big, respectable <laughs> kingdom, right? From, the you know, the, the Nile to the Euphrates, essentially, okay? Not like the Nile, but... You know, got right. us to that full maximal border that was promised to Abraham. Mm -hmm. Imagine his son needing to go to Shechem in order to be crowned king. Mm. That's pointing to a few things, yeah. And what's, it's, it's very powerful. It's in, it's in Kings 2, and it, it talks about how, you know, you read of how um, the people, in other words, Rechavam went to Shechem, right? Because the people, you know, the people went to Shechem to crown him king. There's a lot there. Why Shechem? It's as if to say, you know, oh, you want to be crowned king? We would love to have you as our king. You, you know, your father, you know, um, brought prosperity or stability or whatever. But you have to come to this very important cultic center this traditional cultic center of the land in order for that to happen. Right. And that's where also the, we know that the, uh, the known commandment of the, the cursings and the blessings also happened, right? Shechem. So exactly. it's almost like setting the law from there, right? Right. Uh, but I, I thought that also one of the reasons why he went there, why was, there's a famous uh, verse that Rehoboam, Rehoboam says, and that would be like, if my father treated you with, uh, sticks, I will treat you with scorpions. Yeah. Uh, why did he say that? He basically said, you know, my little finger is as, is as thick as my, 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 my father's waist, okay. you know? And if, uh, you know, if he, if you, if he, you know, whipped you with, uh, you know, lightly, you know, I'm going to whip you with something even more painful. And um, basically, he didn't know what to do when representatives of the people basically said, how is your policy going to be? Are you going to be as tough as your father? Or, you, or, you, or can you be a little bit lighter on us? And so we took some time and the elders basically said, tell the people what they want to hear. It's, it's going to be easier. You know, you're, they probably would have, they probably said, look, you're not as powerful as your, as your father. You know, give in a little bit. And he also spoke to the young people. And, uh, and they told him that, um, no, if you give them an inch, if you give them an inch, they're going to take an L. Mm. You need to Just double something. down on how tough you're going to be. Right, right, right. And I know that uh, it was also connected to taxes because the agriculture was better in, the, in that part, in the, in the nor more nor northern part of the land. So Could be. So they, they, is there mentioning of anything like that connected to taxes of the on the northern tribes? Um, so it definitely talks about you know how uh, you know seven the Beit Yosef. Ah. It, it it does seem to indicate that the that the the tax mm -hmm. and in those days it wasn't just a wasn't payment, you know it was it was labor it was conscripted labor mm -hmm. and um, it was, seems to have been tougher on the house of Joseph, although I, I'm I haven't really actually looked that closely into that, but that is vaguely what I remember. Interesting. Um, there's something that I'm sure you agree with me after you uh, studied the Samaritans, and that is how so many people do not know and realize how similar is uh, Judaism and Samaritanism. You know, yes. They're, they're really similar, and 
Uh, I think it comes also as, as a way like how similar are is the Torah also, even though there are a few differences of like words here and there, you have the Ten Commandments and you have a few words from past, uh, from present or past to future, all these things, but they are so similar. What would you think are like the, the, some similarities that you saw? For example? Well, I think what people would be most interested in knowing is what about oral Torah? Mm. Yeah, I get asked a lot about that. Because a lot of people, uh, you know, like to assume that the Samaritans are like the Karaites who don't believe in oral Torah. And it's interesting because the Samaritans themselves don't think that they have oral Torah. Mm -hmm. They ask any given Samaritan, yeah. well, do you guys believe in oral Torah? And they say, oh, no, no, we, don't, we only believe in the written. Even though we do have oral Torah, but we don't call it oral And as someone, you know, who studied the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Mishnah Torah, I'm just like, what? This is incredible how, you know, you have the same oral traditions, things that you would not be able to understand from the text. Mm -hmm. For example, that um, you know, the prohibition of cooking a, uh, a kid in its mother's milk is a separation of all dairy from all meat. Or, for example, um, that the day begins from the evening before. Right. Or in fascinating things like um, the, all of the offerings if, um, are cannot be given except when there is a the mikdash, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? right? Right. We don't have right. sacrifices for Jews. Today. It's the Beit Hamikdash in Yerushalayim. <laughs> for Samaritans, it's uh, the 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 Mishkan, the Tabernacle. Right. But it's interesting. Also, how the Shema we read every day, both like the Shema exactly. Whereas you could have just been reading, for example, the Ten Commandments. There are different ways to understand that. And it's very possible that, um, that there was some mirroring going on. In other words, it's very clear that there were times, like for example, in the early Second Temple period, where it seems that Jews were learning a lot from the Samaritans who had remained in the land throughout the exile, mm -hmm. and were basically adopting a lot of uh, uh, things from the Amei Ha'aretz, the people of the land, mm -hmm. who essentially were these tribesmen who had remained. And it seems that the Samaritans also were learning from the Jews at, uh, at different points, particularly in the exile. So that when you do this kind of work, you ha you can't be a simpleton. You can't just be like, wow, they must have gotten this all the way from back from Moses. Mm -hmm. But there are certain things that, uh, that are just uncanny oral traditions that um, do really suggest that there, that there is some sort of an, an oral um, you know, a, 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 a accompaniment of instruction. For example, if you look at shahita, a kosher slaughter, the the laws of kosher slaughter by the Samaritans it's very similar, right? Yeah. are practically identical. Yeah. 99.9% .9 identical. Probably the, the difference would be the verses we read and the direction only of the shahita, but the actual practical. You even do halita, like the Yemenites. Halita is, halita is uh, the boiling of the meat after you know it's um, you know you've uh, it, after the slaughter and everything and before cooking, you know it's, it's in order to drain more of the, the blood. blood. Yeah, it's incredible. So, but um, basically, one of the reasons why the Samaritans also seem so strange is because most Jews don't know authentic Judaism. They actually, you know, they're just um, the only Judaism that they know is basically just what's, you know, um, the popular form of Orthodox Judaism that's widespread. But they don't actually go into the sources and see how Judaism was practiced just 500 years ago. You know, 800 years ago. It's incredible how many people, how many, especially like how many Jewish people do not know about Samaritans. Right. Um, even though there are like a few mentioning of literally the word Samaritan, like it does come like Shomor Mim or right mm -hmm. in, in the Tanakh. Uh, prophets and writings, but it, it's so many, like probably like most uh, actually do not know that we are still alive or such a community um, is still alive. And do you think it's because of the small numbers or? Just yeah, simply? that makes a lot of sense. Mm. Let me give you a little example of like, you know, people look at the Samaritans, they go, this is some sort of a weird, you know, cult that doesn't seem very Israelite, who knows what it is they are, some kind of... Of a, of a misguided Arabs or Muslims or whatever. This is amazing. 
um, you know, the fact that you wash your feet, you do all, all of these ablutions mm -hmm. before prayer. That's in the Mishnah Torah of the Rambam. Rav Sa'ad Yaga'on, in his Sidur, talks about these five different types of ablutions. So if you would have go, gone back to the Geonic period, like, you know, 1300 years ago, Jews and Samaritans, the practice? The same. Okay. Or, for example, the fact that you bow down. And the bowing down of Samaritans is distinct from that of Muslims and actually pays respect to um, notes on how to prostrate by Maimonides to a student of his. For example, you're careful not to raise up your rear end. Or, for example, or that you... Uh, uh, how, how do you bow exactly on... The, the hands are usually like this. Right. In other words, not touching... Closer your forehead on the to, on the, ground, to yeah. the ground so um it's 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 very very fascinating and prostration happens to be one of the um like can you say it's not something that would like um delegitimize one's prayer according to maimonides but it's one of like it's something obligatory according to jewish halacha to do right after the standing prayer mm. so. well we do see like from the torah there's many prophets that also kind of bow down even abraham Avinu, right sure right. um and it's definitely like um uh, i did see some also jewish people doing it i'm not sure like what at what times or in, if they were in a specific community but right. i did see that uh you've also uh you, you you saw the 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 uh, Samaritan prayers right so they're like um, we have something called kitter is that also in Judaism where there's like red portions of Torah chosen and read really quickly Do, is that also in Judaism or? um no there's no nothing like that not really hmm. there are uh, things that are like that from like the Mishnah like for example um the um the lighting of the uh, sorry the, the incense offering mm -hmm. in other words there's, there's, there's something called parashata katoret which is basically from the mishnah about how the incense was lit in the temple and that's very very similar to your ketif right. but um basically the focus in the samaritan prayers from what i've observed is you know humash 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 the torah of moses and um, um basically along with with poems of your sages and right. po po and poets right what uh, a beautiful 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 uh, throughout poems the and, ages yeah we have beautiful poems and chants that were uh, given to us by by our ancestors especially like my favorite would be Marke. Marke was a genius and he he not only wrote uh chants but also like beautiful beautiful philosophy which mm -hmm. i'll be sharing obviously soon uh on the channel and a couple of the midrash the midrashic points that he brings um, there's so many Midrashim, by the way. Midrashim, by the way, are legends, um, you know, about, you know, how things happened mm -hmm. and are in common between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. Mm -hmm. And um, a couple, however, of the Midrashim that you'll find in Samaritan lore are actually helpful to, to my work. And that is, you know, uh, basically synthesizing the Torah narrative mm. with history. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and coming to sort of understand on the ground in a sense, you know, what happened and how things were. Wow. So I just, um, I find in you guys really just this treasure drove of cultural wisdom. And uh, um, on its own, it's not perfect. Or are we, can we integrate? The in the Jewish, Jewish people, people right? right? What we have is definitely not complete. Together, it's in, it's unbelievable. Beautiful. Um, we're kind of like almost uh, short on time, but I, you know, I don't get to see you every day face <laughs> to face. So uh, please excuse me with one final question. Um, one time you mentioned um, a point about Deuteronomy uh, in the Samaritans and how it kind of like helped kind of maybe connect some links in the Jewish uh, Torah? Do you, do you sure. know what I mean? Well, one of the most um, annoying opinions among the academics is that Deuteronomy was written much, much later. And um, there are several reasons why. 
Um, but what's fascinating is that if you look at the um, basically chapters 12 and 13 of Deuteronomy that speak about, you know, the, the chosen place for exclusive cultic worship. Mm -hmm. And you can see that, you know, when Joshua goes and fulfills dutifully those, uh, you know, the, you know the, basically the mandate of Moses to establish the Mikdash, Right. To the, the you know in uh, in Shechem, right? So he's clearly not veering from what Moses commanded. So it's pretty clear in retrospect. If you put take the end of Joshua, like we're talking about um, chapter twenty four mm -hmm. verses twenty five to twenty six, and you juxtapose that with the laws about the you know the the, the chosen place for exclusive worship, it's pretty obvious that it's Shechem. Especially if you understand that, uh, and by the way, this is no affront in any way to uh, mature Judaism, because Judaism is an organic faith that believes that things can evolve mm -hmm. and do evolve. So in other words, I just want to put that out there, sure. that this doesn't need to be any sort of an affront in any way, shape, or form to Judaism. It's just that when we are honest about what happened in the ancient past, it just it's a breather for everyone because we can actually synthesize everything together and go, wow, it really makes sense. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Genesis and you can see why is this almost, a, there's this obsessive focus on Shechem, Abraham, you know, Jacob and all of these. Yeah, it's, it was it's very Shechem, Shechem oriented. Shechem was like the first city uh, Abraham entered when he entered the Holy right. Land. Wasn't it? And why did, you know, when he even returns from Egypt, he, you know, he goes back to the place where he built his first altar. Why? So you have to read these things from an ancient, through ancient eyes. And it's very, very clear that it's setting up a precedent for those laws in Deuteronomy. And, um, and basically what, what this kind of an awareness does is it ties the whole Pentateuch together. What it does is it basically shows that it is truly one book it's not just a collection of um you know contradictory uh points and um of course you know there are many of these um, supposed contradictions you know within the text and uh, but if you speak to a um you know an expert in this field and um, you can actually understand how these contradictions really disappear when you're uh, so but this is, but understanding the importance historical importance of Shechem to the people of Israel it's a very important key that basically holds the entire Pentateuch together incredible well thank you so much uh, for, for answering that um, it, it's true you know they say time flies flies fast when you're having fun and uh for me learning is like the most fun uh thank you so much for doing this well i've learned you know? i've learned very much from you and that's very important <laughs> to, to say and i have you know, so much to thank you and for your amazing hospitality and uh of course you know being uh, the resource that you've been you're very welcome <laughs> uh, i have a feeling this would be one of many many meetings uh you know uh, of course uh there's like we just scratched the surface on this one. Uh, and I think that there's like m many, many uh, questions like the one the people watching have. And sure. I think we will leave it for the next uh, time. Let's do this. Maybe, so. <laughs> Amazing. So uh, I'll leave also um, the links to your uh, channel and uh, your work. Awesome. Give them a follow, guys. I, I love uh, Moy Michelle's uh, work. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you again. Hope you have uh, an amazing week. Thank, thank you for you coming. So much. <laughs> Always awesome. an honor. All right, and don't forget, guys, leave, do leave a like, share the video, and uh, do subscribe if you're not already. We just uh, starting this journey, so see you.